good morning everyone. My name is Craig. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about fishes, turtles, and careers. So before we get started, I acknowledge that the land and water on which I live, work, and strive to protect is on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapiwak, and Chonongton peoples. And I just want to take this opportunity to remind everybody that this isn't a simple checkbox item. Uh, rather, it's a recognition of a relationship, a relationship uh, that is built on trust, honesty, and reconciliation. Now, to begin the talk, we're going to play a game. Does this fish species live in Ontario? Raise your hand if you think yes, and then raise your hand if you think no, and we'll go through the answers at the end. So here we go. So the first one is this guy. In Ontario, who's going to put their hand up? Oh, not in Ontario? Don't want to participate? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, there's 10 of these, so we've got to get your hands up. Next one. How about this guy? Oh, gal. In Ontario. Yes? Love it. Not in Ontario? Less so. One confident man, like it. Okay, how about this one? Oh, I heard some murmurs or something. Ain't good. So yes for Ontario, no? Okay, we got no, brilliant. Oh, well, this crazy looking fish. Ontario? Yes? What about not Ontario? Okay, it's getting repetitive, I know. I'll pass through them now. Okay, how about this one? Yes? I like the yeses. How about the noes? Couple of undecided. Oh, what about this tropical one? Yes? Okay, we're getting good at this. What about this fish? This is a fish. Yeah, we've seen these, okay. We know those ones. Yeah, all right, that's good. And what about these three beauties? Ontario? Not Ontario? Okay, we're almost there. How about this catfish? Yes? Okay, some people might know their fish ID in here. And last one. The snout on this one. Ontario? And not Ontario. Okay, so every single fish is in Ontario. Now, this wasn't Craig playing a trick on you. This is just an exercise to show the diversity that's in your backyard that you might not be aware of. And how on earth are you gonna protect things that you don't even know exist where you live? So what is a species at risk? In its simplest terms, it's a species, of, so a species at risk, or SAR, a plants and wildlife um, that are at risk of extinction. So you could argue that anything's at risk of extinction. Uh, this pyramid scheme here outlines the different tiers. Sun at the bottom, special concern, or as biologists joke, somewhat concern, because uh, you don't really get the protections. And then as you work your way up, you get to the most severe, which is extinct, which means you no longer exist on the entire planet, gone from existence. A couple of definitions to go through as well. You might have heard me say fishes and think, what is he on about? Is it fish or fishes? This is actually accepted scientific terms for the two of them. So fish, think of a fish tank of just the same species. So just a bunch of guppies in the tank. Then fishes is multiple species. So think about the ocean. There's multiple different species on a reef. So there's, there's terminology to use, to use in there. So when we look at fishes on the global scale, and they are the most diverse group of vertebrate on the planet. So there's about 35,000 different types of fish. And of those 35,000, about 12,000, 43% are freshwater. And then when we look at Canada and Turtle Island, where we all live, Canada houses um, 230 freshwater fish species. And then Ontario, this is where it gets pretty cool, there's 129 native species, 21 introduced, which makes Ontario the most diverse for fishes in the whole of Canada. So it's a pretty special place. And the, the Sydenham River where I work, which I'll touch on next, and the Thames are two of the most diverse. 
So threats. Now I'm not going to go through these extensively because they'll turn into a lecture, but we have multiple threats that affect fishes in Ontario. So invasive species, we have which is simply species that didn't evolve here and have been introduced, whether accidentally or on purpose. We have common carp, round goby, some of the bad ones. Aaron mentioned some of the mussel ones as well. Uh, we have habitat loss. Now this just isn't, it's not habitat loss directly in the stream, but it can also be the connecting land. So in that image, you can see that the riparian zone has been decimated. So that interface between the land and the water. And the smaller these areas get, the less capacity they have to filter and catch runoff. So, and then habitat loss can also be within the stream. So I don't know if you've ever been to Mississauga and you see these concrete channels, this channelization where they've taken rivers, doused it in concrete and it's just to get the water off the land, which is not habitat for, for anything. Sedimentation and siltation. So siltation is all the sort of runoff, the particulates in the water. Think of it as sort of like smog, but in the water. Air quality warnings in the water. So if you're a fish and you're trying to breathe and you fan in that water over and it's full of particulates, this it's going to cause some damage. It's not good for you. And also, if you're a visual predator or a visual feeder, you're not going to be able to find your food. And then sedimentation, all eventually all that silt settles and can smother the habitat that you're living in. So different species that require sand instead of silt, that becomes a problem. Dams, we don't really have anything on this scale, but they, you know, it blocks connectivity for fish. Fish move up and down rivers. So this can have an impact, separate populations. Climate change, um, I'm sure everybody in this room is well versed in this. Droughts, flooding, like fish can actually have too much water. So flooding, if you're a, a fish that's not a very strong swimmer and you live in this little area and this massive flood comes through, it's gonna blow you out of your home. So flooding, as well as drought. Drought's an easy one to picture, but flooding's a bit more difficult. And then pollution comes in all different flavors, plastic, Light pollution, noise pollution, chemical pollution, nutrient overloads. So there's a lot going on there. So switching gears to where I work, this is a map of the St. Clair Region Conservation Authority watershed. And um, Aaron also touched on this as well. So there'll, there'll be a little bit of overlap, but we, we, we're neighbors, so we work, work quite closely. Uh, so we have the North and East Sydenham and those fresh key biodiversity areas, there, there's, 12, there's 12 of them, the Sydenham River was identified as one. And what that means is, it's an area identified by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and it's significantly contributing to the global persistence of biodiversity. So like, we're, this is on the global recognition, so this is a really important area. A couple of other facts about it is it lies completely within the Canadian Carolinian life zone, which is a very threatened habitat, but a very special habitat. It's kind of the area where the most frost-free days are, so you get a lot of diversity. Um, not to steal the limelight from the Thames River, but the most muscle-diverse river in Canada is the Sydenham River. And it also, of those 129 fish that are native, there's about 80 plus species that live in the Sydenham. So a pretty unique place. Sawfishes of the Sid, there are 10. So again, all of these are in Ontario. Um, I'm not gonna go through each one. I've picked up two to highlight. But as you can see, they look, they're all very different. They all serve different roles. They're all different niches of habitat. So one species highlight is the black stripe top minnow. Uh, it might look a bit tropical, it's, it's related, or Central American, it's related to the guppy. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't think that was in Ontario unless I was a biologist. So it's distribution, the entire Canadian population is found within the sit. It's the only place it is, so that makes it quite vulnerable too. It's a surface dweller, it likes warm water with lots of terrestrial vegetation that hangs over because it feeds Half its diet comes from terrestrial bugs. So you can see it's got quite a flat head. It cruises along the surface and just picks off all those terrestrial bugs. So it needs that riparian stuff that I was talking about. Uh, and then the threats, the loss of that, obviously. Another one to highlight is the northern mad tom. Uh, this is a super, super rare fish. Um, as you can see, 1929 and 1975 are the only times it's been detected in the Sydenham River. It's in some other areas. 
uh, like the, uh, the Detroit River and St. Clair River. And it's a noctil, nocturnal species, so it cruises around on the night, uses those characteristic whiskers to sense out prey. And then a really interesting point is it stings. So its pectoral fins have like, it's kind of like a bee sting and it can inflict bad wounds. Um, I can attest to it, Aaron can attest to it, <laughs> it hurts. So how do we monitor for fishes? Um, well, there's two methods that we use for a river. One is an electrofisher. Anybody have any idea what that is? Some people are nodding, yeah. So essentially, you're wearing your Ghostbuster backpack and you emit an electrical current into the water and it stuns the fish. Doesn't kill them, stuns them, the fish goes upside down, you scoop them up in a net, take them back, ID them, measure them, no probing, send them back in the wild. So it's like a little mini alien abduction. And then we also use nets, which have been used by humans to catch fish for millennia. So you drag a seine net through the water and collect the fish that way. Because the smaller the fish, the less impact the electric has on it. The bigger fish, more impact, so you often miss a lot of the little fish. That's when the net comes in and captures all those ones. Now I have some, some case studies, just, just two case studies on some of the work that we've been doing. Um, one of the most invasive species we have is the round goby. I'm sure everyone's quite familiar with it. First detected in the St. Clair River in 1990, um, and then within a decade it spread to all five Great Lakes. It's aggressive, it reproduces rapidly, um, which, is, which is causing some problems that I'll touch on in a moment. Um, what we've been doing is monitoring 10 sites. So these sites have been monitored, I think it's seven times now in the last sort of 20 years. And we do the electrofishing, we do the same netting, and we get all our catch data. So we've done this for the last three years and we've captured just over 10,000 individual fish. And a lot of them have been goby. And conversely, the fish in the top corner there, we've only caught two of, and that's the Eastern Sand data. So there's something going on and there's a relationship. So when we look at the science, and this is a primary publication that came out, what's happening is, is that the goby have shifted the feeding ecology of benthic species in the Sydenham, the eastern sand data being one. So it's actually direct overlap. And another thing about goby is they have better sensory, like they have heightened sensory organs that allow them to feed at night as well. So they're just feeding around the clock, so outcompeting the sand data. So within this three year period, 10,000 other fishes, hundreds of them being goby, and only two eastern sand data. So, you know, not going well. Another one we have is with, someone did say alligator gar, but I've got to get rid of your hopes and dreams. It's a spotted gar. We don't actually have alligator gar, but it's, they do look similar. So the spotted gar, ancient fish, has lived, you know, was swimming around before the dinosaurs were, were around, and we're doing coastal wetland restoration. So that top left picture you can see there is a farmer's field, which is right on uh, Rondo Bay that leads out into Lake Erie. We have retired that land and it is reverting back to what it once was before it was dug up and drained, um, which is a coastal wetland. So that's a picture in June. There's another picture in, in the winter time. Um, so this work is ongoing and we, at the moment, we've created sort of six hectares of spotted gull habitat, particularly spawning habitat, where they like to go to lay their eggs. Uh, so some really cool work going on there. Now to change things completely, so if the muscles, the faceless muscles didn't get you excited, the icky fish didn't get you excited, I'm sure the turtles is gonna get everybody on board. We'll deal with some misconceptions first. Okay, so wh why does a snapping turtle bite? Does anybody know? Why they're so aggressive? Go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely for protection. But does anyone know? It's just a little bit more. Go ahead. It can't pull into shell. Excellent. Yeah. So, most turtles, as you can see in cartoons, hide in their shell, put the flap up, and then they're, they're relatively safe. Snapping turtles. They can't do that. The plastron, the shell underneath, is really small. So they've gone down the other evolutionary path of getting big, thick limbs, thick neck, and acting aggressively. 
Um, so it's not that they're grumpy, it's just that they're sad they can't fit in their shell while they're jumping out. And then the one on the right you saw was an uh, eastern spiny soft shell, which I'm going to touch on in a moment. Um, yeah, the turtles aren't slow. They are absolutely rapid. Now looking at turtles on a global scale, so this is just a very miserable stat, and I promise they'll get happier. 61% uh, of the world's 356 turtle species are threatened or extinct. So there is, there's something bad going on. These are alarm bells ringing. When we dial our focus into Ontario and Canada with a simple chart, three columns and a splash of color, green obviously being a good color, the rest not so good, um, all our native species are now somewhere on a list from special concern, threatened, to endangered. And those definitions have legal merit. They carry legal weight under the Species at Risk Act or the Endangered Species Act. So, you know, endangered is a wildlife species that faces imminent extirpation or extinction from the wild. So what's causing this? Well, the list is exhausting for turtles. I'm not going to go through each one. I'm going to, I'll, I'll just I'll go through a couple, and then I'll jump onto the two uh, the two main ones I have. So habitat loss, fragmentation, degradation. So livestock stamping on turtle nests, water control structures causing flooding of turtle nests, human subsidized predators. That's a more complex one, and I have it next. Road mortalities, boat collisions, fishing bycatch, the illegal collection for pet trade and medicine. Um, poaching is prevalent in Ontario. People might think of it as on the Serengeti, but it happens here. Persecution. People just kill turtles. Um, we have lots of examples of it. It's, it's quite a confusing concept for me. Pollution, chemical, nutrient, noise, invasive species, disease, habitats not being allowed to success because they get developed, and then the one that's affecting everything, climate change. So the two I'm going to touch on are habitat loss and human subsidized predators. So this is a pretty neat map by Ducks Unlimited that shows wetland coverage. So the top one is circa 1800, so pre-settlement. And then the map at the bottom is 2010. And, what it, and the colors are percent cover of wetland. So blue is greater than 60% and the orange is less than 5%. So within this time frame, we've lost 1.4 million hectares of wetland. And that's where our, our turtle species live, right? So a huge change on the landscape, just immense by this, by the map you can see here. Human subsidized predators, again, this one's a little more difficult to understand, but we'll, we'll go through it. Uh, it's essentially an ecosystem that's not balanced anymore. Turtles have played the number game for millennia. They lay eggs, crawl out, lay eggs, the eggs hatch, groovy, it all works well. But unfortunately, the number of predators, or mesopredators, those mid-level ones like raccoons and foxes, those numbers have increased. And they increase because of us, because they do well around us. So you've got all those threats that I just listed, that we're driving adult population numbers down, whilst we're also driving up the mesopredator numbers, and that balance is completely out now. So the next, the next that are left are getting, the predation rates are through the roof. One of our sites we have in the Sydenham, it is a 99% predation rate. 1% of eggs will survive in a season. And if we, we collect, I'm gonna get, get into it now, we're gonna collect them, but if we don't collect them, they're gone. So that whole generation's wiped out in one season. And this is, I know this is a lot of text, but it's just kind of bring, in, bring it all together. So it's the turtle's life history versus the human age. So turtles, late age and maturity, you know, some of them can take up to 20 years before they even have their first clutch of eggs. Um, there is kind of like a natural low survival rate of turtles, that, hence why they play the numbers game. Lots of turtles, lots of eggs. Um, they can take up to 50 to 80 years to replace themselves in the wild. So you've got to reach a minimum of 50 before you can even successfully replace yourself in the population. And again, they're quite long lived and they can live for over 100 years. So, the human world, there's fewer turtles reaching that 50, 80 because they're getting caught up in all those threats that are being pushed on them. Um, the habitat loss directly impacts populations by preventing opportunities to expand range. So that fragmentation, turtles, they move, they wander, they're quite terrestrial, so they walk around. 
and they've got to go through farm fields and roads. It becomes uh, very difficult. And then obviously climate change is in there as well. So in the simplest, simplest terms, you're all too intelligent for this equation, but it's not really mathematically correct, but fewer turtles, fewer nests, fewer eggs, fewer turtles. So Craig, you have just made us all miserable about all the bad things that are happening, so please give us some good news. Well, at the St. Clair Region Conservation Authority and at Upper Thames, there's a captive hatch and release program. So all those nests that get predated, we're stopping that from happening by collecting the eggs and doing artificial incubation and then releasing them into the wild. We do have a target species, which is the spiny soft-shell turtle. How many people have seen one of these in the wild? Awesome. Yes, I know you have. Yeah, so they really, re now you might not have seen one, they're highly aquatic, so they spend a lot of their time hiding um, in the water. And there are also estimates there's only about a thousand adults left in the whole of Canada. So a pretty, a pretty rare individual. Uh, some facts about them, they can live up, uh, live up to 50 years, reach sexual maturity at 12. They've been tagged and they've seen them moving 30 kilometers up a river to, the, to nesting sites and then back to feeding habitat. Just a little bit more information about their distribution. Um, so yeah, like I said, only about a thousand left in Canada. The number in the Sydenham of adults, is, we don't actually know. It's still, a, still something that needs to be figured out. And then one thing to touch on is um, the Kosiewicz report, that in the last 20 years, those populations have reduced by 45%. So what does it look like to collect turtle eggs? So this is what it's like, awful, 40 degrees, crawling on your hands and knees, carefully scraping with a muscle shell to try to locate eggs without cracking any of them, and then carrying them safely out of the forest to the incubator, and then wait in two months, the turtles that we get that come out of the nests. So again, have incidental calls, so landowners have, oh, this turtle's on the side of the road, or it's in my driveway nest, and so we collect those. So you've got map turtles, spotted turtles, painted turtles, snapping turtles, and then on the right then is the blanding turtles. And I have some data to share with you. So this doesn't show population increase. This just shows how more successful and better biologists are getting at finding and protecting nests. So just for the blue one again is spiny soft shell, that's our target species. When this program first started in 2016, there were 67 eggs collected. We're now looking at 2,000 soft shell eggs. And we're releasing about 1,700 of them back into the wild. So it's just, again, not population increase, it's just showing how, um, how better we're getting at collecting them. Now we're moving on to the third and final part of this talk, which is careers. Uh, so I'll touch on my personal career path, uh, where all the work is, and then we'll just take a quick peek at what the current green environmental job market looks like and the projections up until 2025. I have a Bachelor of Science in Policing, which I am not using right now. So a complete career change for me. My undergrad is in how to be a police officer. Uh, I went to Fleming College, highly recommend, fantastic program, fantastic professors. I worked at a research lab at the University of Toronto, and then I dipped into conservation authorities. And I sort of, you pick your niche, my niche was like aquatics, I really enjoyed that, so I just followed my passion and, and went down that route. But this is by no means like linear. A lot of this is bouncing back and forth of jobs to find permanency. Um, so contracts in different areas. Um, so it, this is just, it's not a bragging thing, this is just to show that there's different ways of getting into the field. Where is all the work? Um, so 36 conservation authorities in Ontario. We're the only province that have conservation, auto conservation authorities, which I'm very proud of and we do a lot of good work. Um, there's NGOs, so the Canadian Wildlife Federation, Nature Conservancy Canada, universities, research labs, so all the grad students are always hiring research techs to go and help them do the work. So you get to work on really cool science and uh, like the frontier science. 
the province, we'll just leave that alone in a second. Uh, federal, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, consulting companies, Ontario Federation of Angler and Hunters, there's some good internships in there. And then out of province work, there's loads of jobs you can go to the Costa Rica and do different work and I highly recommend it. Now next, I'm sure everybody has read from recession to recovery, environmental workforce needs, trends and challenges, updated labor market opinion. Boring report, but I've read it for you. But it's really, really exciting. So just focus on that tree for a minute. So this is up to 2025. The newest report hasn't come out, because I know the age of some of you might not be there yet. But there are 172,000 172, green jobs that are coming through this period up to 2025. Right, so some of them are new jobs, expansion and demand, and other ones are replacement. So there's 98,000 people retiring. So they, their jobs need to be filled. And then when those people move up, there's more jobs at the lower levels as well. So where are these jobs? This is a my slide, it's taken from Eco Canada. Um, they actually helped support my position at one point and paid for my salary. So just focus on the, on the red things, there's a lot of text and numbers and also. But look, 79,000 jobs in sustainability, natural resource management, uh, fish, fisheries and wildlife. So this is, this is a good sign, the green economy is booming. So this is good news for you guys. And then where are these jobs? Well, it's not just Ontario, it's all through Canada. So again, if it doesn't work out here, feel free to move and explore. Finishing up now, not many slides left for you. Um, scientific conferences. Um, I'm heavily involved with the American Fishery Society, um, but there's also the Ontario chapter of the Wildlife Society. So if you're in, more into terrestrial stuff than aquatic, there's even a conference from mollusks, an entire two-day conference about snails, mussels, and all the other mollusks. Great time, I highly recommend it, learn a lot of stuff. And then there's also, this is brand new, the Society of Canadian Aquatic, sorry, <laughs> new, I guess I can't say it. Science, Society of Canadian Aquatic Sciences, which is another huge conference. This year it was just in Montreal in February. Now, they're a little expensive to go to, but there's lots of bursaries you can apply, and you just get to meet so many like-minded people um, that can help you steer your own career. What do we look for? At minimum, university degree. We don't hire anybody who doesn't have a university degree. So that's kind of the standard that you, the benchmark you want to go through. College diploma, so something from uh, Fleming or other colleges, certifications, volunteer hours, and the most important thing is passion because the work is pretty awful. Um, it's pretty miserable <laughs> dealing with all these endangered species, um, but it can be really rewarding. So passion is the main one. One more shameless plug of the website that we've worked really hard on. So you've heard the Sydenham River name come up a lot today. Check out this website. We update it regularly with stories about the work that we're doing and also the species profiles of everything that happens uh, in the Sydenham. And to wrap things up, I leave you with a quote of one of my heroes. If working apart, we are a force powerful to destabilize our planet. Surely working together, we are powerful enough to save it. And with that, I will gladly take any questions.